Allison. Hi, Michael. And welcome to the Dean's Discuss COVID-19, a weekly podcast where we're diving into the research here at uh, UC Davis, both in the School of Veterinary Medicine, as well as the School of Medicine. Well, today we're picking up where we left off last week on the subject of innovation happening at both campuses. It's all focused on understanding and treating COVID-19. I saw an amazing um, uh, editorial uh, written in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science this week. And one of the co-authors was one of my faculty members, Dr. John Mazet of the One Health Institute. And the subject was interesting. It was about how do we use genomic tools to understand and combat pandemics, but it took it beyond just kind of what we think about for genomics. And genomics is, is really the comparison of of you know what we know about the DNA sequence of organisms, whether it be a virus or a person, and how do we get information from that to make decisions? And what they took it to a different level, which was how do we use that innovative technologies in a broader sense? So there's multiple schools of thought, there's multiple programs around the world stimulated in part by the pandemic uh, to come together and use those tools to understand the diversity of life on the planet. So they want to sequence and catalog um, all of the uh, organisms on the planet eventually uh, so that we understand and protect them um, because biodiversity is, is really important for us to, to preserve the planet. And in the case of viruses, there's a, a project called Global Virome Project where they want to catalog and sequence all of the known human viral pathogens. And this grew out of what we talked about last time, which was the PREDICT project. So the PREDICT project was around going into those areas, understanding what the source of the virus was. Now they want to take that to the next broader level and to catalog, catalog all of the human viral uh, pathogens that can cause disease. Now, why do we want to know that you know, you probably deal with a lot of data. Um, as a physician, how, how would a catalog like that be helpful for making decisions and, and developing tools uh, against a pandemic? So I think one of the most important things you said is the predictive piece. So, you know, one of the things people are really scared about right now is a resurgence and a second wave of just COVID. And then, as you mentioned, there's all these other things out there. And so I think there's a concern really about, well, you know, how come we didn't know this was coming and how do we predict the second wave? And then how do we predict any other virus, COVID or otherwise? You know, that's, I think, what's really got people really scared. I mean, the number of deaths, um, if we could predict on what the next pandemic was going to be and what kind of virus and get to work on that ahead of time and even think about learning all that we need to learn before it potentially comes to light, that would be huge. Mm -hmm. So I think um, really utilizing these models you know, could, could come down to where people would realize how important it is to fund things like PREDICT because they're proactive rather than reactive. That's been my really concern about what's going on here is we're all reacting, but boy, it would have been great if we could have predicted that this COVID was going to come up and be one of the next, you know, SARS and MERS and all that stuff. It's not like we didn't have a little bit of a heads up on from those other things. And programs like PREDICT and what you've been describing. It's so important, this, this understanding of the interface, and you brought up another issue about the climate and understanding how that puts us, us at risk for a society for these things to come up. And that innovation, we talked about the mathematical modeling last time and the, the, the way that we're using data like that one of the, the really critical issues also and that you brought up is it, as we go into the, the, the next phase and we have these potential uh, next waves of virus infection is contact tracing. And so one of the innovations that we're really seeing also is what are the innovative ways to contact trace? Um, and you know, by that, you know, when an individual is infected is to really quickly understand you know, who have they come in contact with? Uh, how do we 
uh, protect them from spreading uh, further. Uh, could, could you, I mean, I know that's really critical to well, interventions at the medical school. Yeah, so, you know, I am not an expert in that, but I've seen several presentations about how you um, look at one person and all the different people they came in contact with. And, you know, when we talk about contract tracing right now, we're talking about a very laborious piece, um, you know, going and knocking on doors, essentially. And we have to get to a point where we're either using cell phone or other things, other countries are doing that. I know that um, the engineering school, our vice chancellor of research is working with some students on a, on a um, uh, app that's similar uh, because we're gonna have to figure that out. And you know, this hit, hits home for me because I have a soon to be junior at UNC and going back to college, you know, how are they gonna do contact tracing in a college when a, you know someone gets sick. And so I've been really impressed with all the administrators at UC Davis who have these wonderful plans on how they're gonna do that. And it, um, it, it's very reassuring, but we need to use technology to figure out the contract tracing. Um, and then we also would, I think, we're gonna need to come up with some protocols for outpatient treatment because we're taking care of the very sick with the protocols that we have, but I don't know if really any outpatient treatments that shorten the course of the disease or keep people from being viral shedders or those type of things, because that is going to really help us do, you know, so you find out that someone was sick, you figure out who all they did, because now you, you did HIV, right? Mm -hmm. So if someone gets stuck with a needle now, from a HIV positive tr patient, there's a whole protocol for that, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and people right on top of it. So you don't wait, you know, you, you deal with it right then and there. And I think that's what we should move towards, towards, you know, people who are exposed, but we're not anywhere near that. I don't really know of any drugs right out that are for outpatient, but we certainly are interested in that. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it's a misnomer if we're going to treat our way out of a, a viral infection. And you know, the, the, the things about tracing that is really critical. You mentioned, um, you know, like uh, using our cell phones. And a lot of people are very concerned about the privacy aspects of that. And I, I think we have to figure out in our society, how do we use the technology without violating people's um, privacy? And, you know, the, the anonymous way that other countries are doing this, the, the ways that are being developed in this country the way that we see that in our own engineering school develop it, it allows that privacy piece uh, to be um, sacrosanct. So it's not about revealing your identity of your cell phone. It's about, yes, uh, I'm entering into a building and that building uh, may have had somebody before me that had tested positive. And if you knew that, um, those are the kind of things that later they can go back and crunch the data and say, this is where the um, uh, problem started. And if you can do that uh, through the Bluetooth devices or yeah. these technology, then the contact tracers have electronic tools or have better and more accurate data than you said, like you know, knocking on doors. Uh, and so as we look at the technology, the, I think the other way that technology is really gonna enter into this is the massive amounts of way and the high throughput way that we can compare the viruses because when we say SARS-CoV-2, we you know it's not one virus; it's a virus that continually changes, and that's what viruses do: they mutate, they evolve, and they're evolving with us as they spread. So even the the very earliest ones in its origins within China are not necessarily the the same exact strains that are here in the United States. So some of our researchers are taking technology that they've used in other fields and doing sequence analysis and comparing the genomes of all the isolates that are um, happened in your patients as well as others because we had the technology do that very rapidly with what we call whole genome sequence which wasn't even possible you know even a, a five or ten years ago certainly wasn't possible in the scale that's available now so technology to understand not only you're infected, but, oh, by the way, you have a different virus than um, maybe what was in Seattle or other parts of the country. 
that's really critical because that helps us make decisions then on vaccines or maybe even um, how fast it's going to spread. Well, isn't that what they do with flu because they determine the virus and then they make the flu vaccine. And so there, I think you're absolutely right. People are really looking at that. Um, I do want to make a comment though, because um, everybody's opening up. And um, as a physician, I have watched people not social distancing. I saw 20 people sitting and eating lunch in close quarters. Only one had a mask. But today I saw something very lovely where um, two, one young person wearing a mask told the other that they needed to wear a mask for themselves and to protect their loved ones. And I just, um, I didn't say a word. I just kind of watched it. And it was really an example of uh, peer-to-peer leadership on trying to get someone to wear a mask. And, um, you know, if you're not, if you're going to be six feet apart, uh, we're six feet apart right now, so I'm not wearing a mask. Um, we're, we're we're actually we're, miles apart. <laughs> we're miles apart, right? But um, but you know, if you're close to each other and you're indoors, particularly, you should be wearing a mask. And I think I'm worried about kind of the whole country opening up and gosh, July Fourth coming up, and uh, I'm uh, concerned about that. Um, so you know that. I think that you're bringing up a really important point, which is, you know, we could have all the technology in the world, but if we don't follow basic public health guidelines, it won't matter. Uh, and so, so that's part of that. You know, the other innovative thing that, that you know, when you're talking about masks is I see a lot of innovation towards um, manufacturers of clothes, for example, yeah. uh, the, the type of materials they have, the type of uh, a way that we use technology in um, our everyday lives. One of the interesting parts is the, the built environment, as it's called, in our buildings, the, the homes we live in. Uh, at the university, of course, as we ramp back up, we're thinking about, well, how did we build the offices? Um, it's one thing to um, think about what it was before, but now we have to think about traffic patterns. Uh, what are the barriers between allowing air to be recirculated, how much air is being recirculated. So that's where we need the engineers, we need the uh, uh, people that, that build um, uh, workplaces to, to understand that. We have actually some very innovative things being done here at UC Davis uh, related to the built environment where they're, they're determining what are the organisms in our built environment and how does that change with airflow in a, in a building, for example. Those are all, again, we get back to our uh, discussion about creativity and all of the different people that are needed. You know, we need the engineers, but we also need people that construct the buildings yeah. um, and, and as well to be innovative when we talk about infectious disease control as well as behavior, of course. Well, uh, so in one of our research town halls, Jonathan Eisen gave a great presentation. He's a microbiome um, expert. And so he's really partnering with the uh, uh, School of Medicine to, to look at our environments. You know, um, we all need, as we reemerge, uh, you know, keyboards and stuff we touch. And, you know, that's why wearing the masks are really so important. It's just incredible, though. You know, just think, I was thinking about what it was like in January. And I don't think this was on anybody's radar in December and January. And then our radar, it was February 26, the world changed, at least in Sacramento and Davis, when we had, I and mean, we were on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post and TV and, and, um, and it really allowed us to step back and go, wow, this is like a game changer. Mm. And I, it's just incredible to think now we're in the summer and how much life has changed, how many people have died, how many people have been infected. Um, yeah, and now it's... we're trying to unpack all this science, but it's really brought all hands on deck across the country and particularly in academics and partnership with industry. So, um, you know, it's just been incredible. We, you know, it's very much like the feel after 9-11. You, yes. you, we all remember that, that are old enough to read. You know, I'm, I, it's, it's, it's becoming, I'm becoming 
sound like an old person, but uh, 9-11 changed uh, almost overnight how we uh, interacted, for example, at airports. Yes. How we got through security and every, everybody that went through that, it was so shocking to us of how we had to change our security. Well, in a way, this is our 9-11 for biosecurity. You know, the, the, the influences that, uh, the, the kind of things that we're doing now, we probably should have been thinking about some of this well before that, because by the way, this isn't gonna be our last pandemic. Um, and why do I say that is because the, we've experienced pandemics throughout the history of humankind. Um, you know, yellow fever, I was reading Alexander Hamilton, the book, Alexander Hamilton, which is uh, a great book. And they were describing 1792, 93 in Philadelphia, yellow fever wow. and how it really, and when they was describing that, it was they had to get out of the cities. They had to socially distance. Uh, they became very, uh, and they didn't know the cause. And so it became very problematic. Uh, all they had was social distancing. And wow. um, it, it devastated uh, and changed their lives dramatically. And in that case, Alexander Hamilton and his wife uh, were coming from an area that was uh, yellow fever positive and had a lot of cases. They wouldn't let them back in the city. Um, and so it affected their traffic patterns, their lives. And so, you know, that that's just one example of, of that 1918 influenza. So what happened in 1918, a lot of people talk about 1918. It was actually 1919, there was a second surge of oh influenza. My. And so that's kind of gets back to what you're talking about that we may also see a second surge. So we can't relax when it gets into the fall and winter. We may have a second surge of COVID too. We may be living with this virus infection and we can do it because we've, we've adapted and, and as vaccines get developed, as protocols get developed, as we become more immune as a population, you know, we, we will get past this, but you know, it's not gonna be our last one for sure. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I also think it's so important um, uh, about learning from history on, and what was, what was done right and what wasn't done right. And, um, you know, the, one of the things I like to think about is medicine as a, being a learning health system. And we are really living into that because we're learning every day. Um, and we are taking what we learned from one patient and adapting it. Um, if I recall uh, early on, there was this issue about the way the ventilators were set and they learned what, you know, when to intubate and when not to be in and how much oxygen, et cetera. I am so hoping that we get so many more people to go into medicine and STEM and veterinary medicine and nursing and, you know, health engineering, uh, biomedical engineering, because this is, um, I mean, it's kind of like 9-11, right? 9-11 people went into the service. That's how yeah. they decided to give back. And boy, I hope we get a bunch of students to come into medicine because they want to they wanna stamp out the next pandemic. Wouldn't that be amazing. Exactly. And as they come up through biological sciences and agriculture and think about their uh, degrees, one of the interesting parts that was created from these kind of case studies was a hybrid course that initially was funded through the provost. So the innovation there was in education. Mm -hmm. And the innovation was to bring these case studies to the classroom. You know what that developed out of that was what is our fast, one of our fastest growing undergraduate majors, which is global disease biology. And David Rizzo in plant pathology in the College of Agriculture and Valtrina Smith helped create tracks. One is in plants, one is in animals, but it uses these kind of case studies to really teach people about global disease biology. And, and the students, uh, they voted with their feet, <laughs> the meaning they, they, yeah. they, they were attracted to that. Why is that? I think because uh, the, the younger generation wants to solve the problem. They, they want to be engaged in the problem. And in this case, uh, they see the real world problems that we face and they want to understand what are the knowledge and skills. And that's where UC Davis is adapted and innovated in education with the College of Ag to create this undergraduate major. And a lot of those go into public health. Uh, they'll apply to your medical school. They'll go in as pre-meds, but have a global disease sort of focus when they go into it. And that's wonderful because, you know, we do need that broader 
uh, understanding of the world. Um, even though our training is very narrow sometimes, uh, if you don't have an understanding of all of those factors, it's, it's really problematic. Well, thanks so much for talking with me today, Allison, about the innovations that are going on with, within uh, both of our schools. You know, I think these innovations really point to uh, an idea, an idea to how do these innovations come to market? How do we take these into practical solutions? You know, and that kind of leads into maybe a topic we should talk about next time, which is, you know, how does the university promote and interact with our community and our businesses? And that definitely involves things that, that we have as goals, such as Aggie Square. And I know we are very excited about what's going on with Aggie Square. Oh, yes, I think that'd be great. You know, um, we've had kind of a virtual Aggie Square here over in the School of Medicine with some of the things we've been doing for COVID. So my, great idea, Michael, let's do it. I'm Allison Brashear, the Dean of the UC Davis School of Medicine. And I'm Michael Lermore, Dean of the School of Veterinary Medicine here at UC Davis. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss our next episode. And we welcome your questions and ideas on topics for future episodes. You can email us at deansdiscuss at ucdavis.edu. And you can meantime visit us at ucdavis.edu backslash COVID-19 for the latest coronavirus research from UC Davis. See you next week. <laughs>